very special guest, Donna Betts, is joining us from Washington, D.C. at George Washington University. She is talking with us about the wonders of art therapy and how viable this kind of therapy is. Uh, and so, Donna, we wanted to talk a little bit about, there is, you, you are very involved in research, and we want to talk a little bit about some of the research and, and what the results are. How effective is this for individuals who are on the autism spectrum? So um, a lot of the research we have is anecdotal. There are some uh, more recent studies that have, have uh, looked at, sort of interviewed, for example, um, art therapists who are subject matter experts. Um, there's an article by my colleagues, uh, Teresa Van Lith and Jesse Stallins, for example, who did just that. Um, so there does need to be larger scale uh, you know, efficacy studies. That's, uh, that's definitely a goal that will take place. Um, and in the meantime, you know, there is a lot of strong, again, anecdotal evidence. So a lot of really strong case studies or smaller scale studies that point to the benefits of art therapy with individuals with autism. Can you tell us about some of those case studies? Sure. So um, I, I myself have, have worked with, again, the population as well as um, conducted some case study research. And what I have found is that, first of all, um, in working with an individual with autism, uh, of course, the relationship is is really essential. So the relationship between the therapist and the client, and um, th and partly that's because folks with autism can tend to have um, treatment goals that relate to socialization. So of course, then the relationship becomes key in terms of not only the therapist as a role model, um, and also by the way, when I worked in the school setting. I was very, very um, integrated into the treatment team. So I worked every day with the speech language pathologist, with the social worker, with the school psychologist, with the teachers, with the parents. It's really important to have a really good, strong working relationship th with the whole team so that everyone's on the same page and the individual's getting the optimal services they need. So again, it comes back to the relationships. So but for me, um, some of the kids I worked with also had a background, a difficult background of having been in foster care or having had adverse um, um, experiences that led them to cause them to, to not have a lot of trust for caregivers or teachers or therapists. So trust was was one of the goals that we would work on in developing that relationship. So once you have established a trusting relationship with someone with autism as an art therapist or, or a practitioner of any kind working on a team, um, that's key. And then, and then you can move forward with some of the essential treatment goals. So, um, you know, depending on the individual, um, I would often, for instance, see benefits of the socialization. I would do small groups of art therapy, no more than three individuals with autism. I would try to match the individuals on their skill levels so that if, for example, they were working on um, emotional regulation, we could do some really concrete art therapy-based activities, interventions that would help the three of them work together successfully to have positive and corrective emotional experiences develop trust with one another, and to learn how to communicate effectively through art making in the context of the art therapy session. Okay. Um, tell us about family art therapy and its effectiveness. So that's, again, very important. The families that I worked with were very grateful to have um, any, any support they could find to help them, you know, the parents, uh, the siblings too, who are often assisting at home, again, depending on the level of ability of the individual with autism, uh, different levels of support are needed. So, uh, you know, as an art therapist working with the families, it would, it would, there would be a sort of a psychoeducational aspect to it as well, where, for example, I would show the families what kinds of art interventions I was having success with with their child in art therapy. And then I would literally like teach them how they could try to adopt some of those approaches at home and guide them on what kinds of art materials are appropriate for use with your child outside of the context of art therapy. We as art therapists have to be really cautious about the <coughs> kinds of materials we offer our patients. So for instance, you know, when we're working with someone with a substance use disorder. You don't offer Sharpie markers. You don't offer permanent markers that could, you know, become an inhalant kind of a thing. Uh, so similarly, when working with someone with autism, I've had clients that like to put art materials in their mouth. 
So again, you want to be really careful what kinds of materials you're giving them. If you, if you give them clay, they may eat it, again, depending on the individual. So the parents would need some guidance around that as well. And then continuity is very important for these individuals. And so, and, and regulation, they like to have things to be predictable in their day and their routine. So I would also talk to the families about, okay, this, is, this intervention worked really well in art therapy. Here's how you should implement it at home, not, not just in terms of handing, it's not just a matter of handing the child the art materials, but also the space that's needed, you know, the quiet space that's needed for the child to be able to use materials effectively, the support they need, what a parent should or shouldn't say, for example, when they're, when they're observing their child making art and, and that kind of thing. So a lot of, again, a lot of support and the continuity across from the school setting to the family setting. Okay. I'm dying to know what the face stimulus assessment is and, and what you use it for. Sure. So uh, again, as part of the clinical team uh, where I worked in Washington, D.C. Uh, several years ago with kids with autism, I was required as a clinician to um, provide, a, in relation to the IEP meetings and the, the individual's IEPs, the individual education plans, um, we'd have to, of course, work with the individual's plans and their treatment goals if they had some. And so I would need to administer art therapy assessments. Um, so this is a way that clinicians would gain sort of a baseline of a sense of what, hey, what is this person's skill set right now? Like, where are they in terms of their abilities to, their perceptual abilities to draw? Um, how, how, there's a lot of information we can glean from an art therapy assessment, like from a standardized type of drawing. So I tried a few different approaches to this, and I ended up developing an assessment on my own uh, after years of, it took years to develop, and it's still under, uh, under investigation for validity and reliability and so forth. But my goal was to develop a standardized way to gain a sense of my client's skills. So, and I'm, mostly it was with my clients who were a little bit, who had more challenges cognitively, um, who, for example, if you just were to give them a piece of paper and a marker, they might just do a scribble. I knew there had to be a way to draw out their strengths. Uh, so the face stimulus assessment is a series of drawings uh, that start with an outline and very basic facial features. And, and by the way, the kids that I had the most success with using the face stimulus assessment were kids who were nonverbal, who had communication difficulties, um, but in many cases could understand what I was saying but couldn't speak to me or couldn't uh, articulate their needs. And that becomes an additional challenge for the therapist because then we have to really find creative ways to communicate and alternative ways to communicate. Um, and art therapy is ideal for that because, again, it's very visually based. I work very closely with a speech language pathologist. We had a pic picture symbols way of communicating as well. We, uh, you know, there were different strategies that we, we would apply to kind of come at communication from multiple levels. So the child was getting all the different mechanisms for communication. And so the face stimulus assessment enabled me to at least determine uh, a little bit of information about their memory capacity. Were they able to remember where the facial features were located, for example, on the face over you know, several minutes? And then in the IP goals, I could sort of extend that out over time to just to see if the, the effect uh, would endure, uh, as one example. Amazing. All okay. of this is just too fascinating. Yes, it is. It sounds uh, like it's really a burgeoning field. It really is. Um, it, it's been around, art therapy as a distinct profession in the United States has been around for several decades. Uh, but it's, it, we're, there's still could be many more of us. Um, we're really trying to increase the public awareness of art therapy as a, an option for a, a career choice. And starting in high school, people should start thinking about, you know, if, if you're in high school and you're interested in psychology and you're interested in art, uh, you should consider, you know, in undergraduate uh, education, consider taking the psychology and fine arts requirements for the graduate programs um, and choosing art therapy as a career. That's what happened to me. I, I basically, it's the marriage of psychology and art. Um, and those are my two passions when I was doing my undergraduate degree. And then I went ahead and pursued a master's, which is the entry level for the profession. And so, you know, we're, again, we're trying to really raise awareness of the, uh, how helpful art therapy is for a, a wide range of, of individuals um, and get more people to know about it so they can choose it as a career and help more people. Fabulous. Can you tell us again the websites that you gave us before where we can go to to get more information? 
Yes. So the American Art Therapy Association, that's arttherapy.org. Okay. And we've got and that, that up on the screen. Yep. Yeah. Yes, and that site also, you know, if you're interested in pursuing art therapy as a career, you'll find all that information on arttherapy.org. And then for information about how the profession is regulated, that would be the Art Therapy Credentials Board, atcb.org. And before okay. parents start an art therapy program, they should check there to make sure that the, the person is properly credentialed, correct? Exactly, yes. And that's really important because, you know, because art therapy is mm -hmm. not... Uh, as widespread as we like it to be, um, it's buyer beware. Whatever state you live in, there are slightly different regulations for the profession. Just be careful that if someone's calling themselves an art therapist, that they are an art therapist. And yes, the ATCB site is, is a way to verify that. Um, and some states also have an art therapist license, which is an additional a layer of protection, if you will, for the public from harm. I mean, if you're going to, to an art therapist, of course, you want to make sure that person has the actual qualifications so that you know the, the treatments that are, they're using are appropriate and relevant to your, the, the individual's needs. Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Betts. We've learned a lot about art therapy and autism, and um, I'm sure there are a lot of families out there interested in exploring this for their kids.